1918. After four bitter years, the soldiers were coming home to Canada. The nation gave them a hero's welcome. People were proud of them and appreciated their sacrifices. But after the victory parades, life as usual seemed somehow a disappointment. Work was scarce, and those who found it were restless. They had lost the habit of long hours at the workbench. There were some who had to learn how to work. Others, crippled or gassed, would live out the rest of their lives in soldiers' homes. Disillusion brought the veterans back on parade, this time with petitions. Had their years of fighting not earned them a better life at home? Peace, for that matter, was still elusive. In Russia, the turmoil of war had led to violent revolution. Canadian soldiers were sent with other Western forces to oppose the Bolsheviks. The communists won their fight, but they would always resent this outside interference. Interference worked both ways, and now the revolutionaries were calling for a world revolution of the working classes. This threat produced a red scare throughout the world. At ports of entry into Canada, Mounties searched for radical and seditious literature. In the panic, traditional liberties were endangered. Demonstrating veterans and workers were suspected of seditious conspiracy. Most wanted no more than an end to long hours and low wages. But as the growing unions tested their strength in strikes, they looked revolutionary. Strike leaders were arrested and jailed. Winnipeg was in a state of near siege as the first general strike in Canadian history spread to 30,000 workers. Armed conflict was narrowly avoided and the bitterness survived for years. When calm returned, changes were to come, not through revolution, but by free election. The same strike leaders were to fight for reforms in the legislatures. News of Laurier's death came in the midst of these troubled post-war days. The passing of the old chief was a reminder of a golden age of prosperity and westward expansion. In Ottawa, the Parliament buildings had been rebuilt after a fire, and the wartime government was in its last days. Severely tried by the post-war depression, it had already lost its wartime prime minister. Borden had gone, sick and disheartened. His successor, Arthur Meehan, was defeated in 1921, and the voters returned the Liberals. The Liberals had a new leader, Mackenzie King. In the nation at large, there was a feeling of new times ahead. Yes, Canada was on the move again, and at the wheel of an automobile with a tin Lizzie profile. People had a new assertiveness, though it sometimes got misdirected. Women were becoming more independent as Canadians became sophisticated city dwellers, with a soft spot for the country. The speed limit was 35 miles an hour, and a tow rope was standard equipment. But as new highways were built, touring became a national recreation. Neighbors were drawn closer, and at the border, Canadians and Americans dedicated an arch. The theme was peace. But in faraway Chenac, Britain faced Turkey in dispute over the peace settlement. Mackenzie King refused to give support without the authority of the Canadian Parliament. The crisis passed, but Canada had shown she had reached the age for taking her own decisions. At the Imperial Conference of 1926, Mackenzie King argued his case. The Balfour Report tried to define on paper what the Commonwealth was gradually becoming in practice. A group of self-governing nations, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs. Vincent Massey was sent to Washington as first Canadian minister abroad, a further step to full nationhood. The great post-war wave of immigrants had begun, the third in the nation's history. 
In the 20s, one and a half million settlers came from war-torn Europe, looking for a home and a chance to work in peace. Many moved west to complete the settlement of the Wheatlands. A great new wheat boom rewarded the sodbusters and they exulted in a record-breaking crop. To the north too, there were lands to be opened up. It was time to define Canada's frontiers in the Arctic. Settlement and the presence of law gradually confirmed her sovereignty over half a million square miles of land. On her 60th birthday, Canada completed a tower on Parliament Hill dedicated to peace. The nation threw a party. A confident nation for whom the future seemed to hold promise of unending prosperity. Fortunate is he or she who is young in Canada today, rejoiced one writer. Canada had taken wing in more senses than one. For as early as 1920, the first flight had been made from ocean unto ocean. True, it had been completed in relays and it took 10 days, but with the challenge of its great open spaces and far-flung population, Canada hastened to master this new means of travel. Bush pilots like Doc Oakes, Punch Dickens and Wap May were leapfrogging prospectors and supplies far over the frozen wastes in search of future mines. The citizens of Halifax and Vancouver became close neighbors as the mailman descended from the skies. Canada soon led the world in volume of freight carried by air. The ocean-going ports bustled as the world's shoppers bought the harvests of Canada's mines, forests and farms. Canada was the world's biggest trader in wood products, wheat and nickel. In an easy-going mood, Canada repealed the prohibition on alcohol. The temperance groups protested, but the citizens cheerfully bought their first legal drink in years. Across the border, prohibition was still in effect, but faster than liquor could be poured down the drains, bootleggers from Canada came to the aid of their thirsty American cousins. Anchored off New York, outside the three-mile limit, the rum runners were met by cash-laden boats from shore. Canada had developed a profitable but embarrassing new export. And a new import. The Americans sent us jazz as people took to a fascinating toy called radio. Many considered that radio should provide something more than an unending repetition of hit tunes. They felt it could help to realize the dream of a distinctive Canadian identity. The dream was now becoming a reality in the arts. Hitherto, Canadian painters had been content to follow imported traditions. The group of seven now led a revolt. They proclaimed that Canada's northern landscape was unique. Their canvases were startling. Gone were the customary carbon copies of the European scene. Hot mush, cried the critics, but Canadian painters had won worldwide recognition. A growing band of native authors were also confounding the skeptics. Canadians, too, could contribute to the world's literature. Writing about things Canadian, some became world bestsellers. Even writers were sharing in the general prosperity. Prosperity it was. Onwards and upwards with the Roaring Twenties. True, the stores were bulging with stocks of unsold goods, but nothing that a little advertising would not cure or so it seemed. Prosperity would go on forever. At least all the experts said so. The fun would go on forever too. A new game. Buy stocks and double your money. And an appropriate hit tune. This is my lucky day. 
The market's booming. Become a millionaire. Everybody's doing it. Factories at full throttle. Plenty of work in mass production, so long as the people could go on buying. Prosperity guaranteed, so long as the world could pay for Canada's raw materials.